Hey, everybody's jumping in right now. Just about to get started here with Coach Keelan. Welcome to another edition of the Coach's Corner on the Fitter Faster Swim platform. I'm your host, Mike Murray, as always. Today, we are thrilled to introduce you to the head coach of the Penn Charter Aquatic Club. Before we get started with Coach Crystal, I want to remind our viewers that they are welcome to ask any questions by using our chat box on the right-hand side of the screen. And if we have time at the end of the show, we'll try to get to all of your questions. Um, I do want to remind people that any spammers in the chat box, we will remove you from the webinar. I also want to let our viewers know that if you stay to the end of the webinar on Thursday with Coach John Urbanchek, we're going to be giving away one free Carbon Core FX racing suit by Arena. So stay on. Coaches, if you're on this uh, webinar today, you can certainly remind your athletes to join that webinar on Thursday. And uh, that way they will have a chance to win that Carbon Core FX racing suit by Arena. A lot of people love that suit. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Crystal Keelan, the head coach of the Penn Charter Aquatic Club in Philadelphia. Welcome, Crystal, to the Coach's Corner. There she is. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing great. Coach Keelan has extensive experience working with all levels and age groups in the sport and has been at Penn Charter since 2012. Is that right? Is that when you started there? Yep. Awesome. During that time, Crystal built a formidable senior program, most notably developing Reese Whitley into one of the most dominant breaststroke IMers in the history of age group swimming in the U.S. Crystal has served as a member of the national junior team staff and Team USA staff and also had multiple roles in the Middle Atlantic LSC. So, Crystal, how is everything going for you during these crazy times? How has your team handled the COVID-19 crisis? They are doing surprisingly well. Obviously, it's really tough. Um, I think, you know, knowing that everyone across the country is dealing with this tough time is, you know, easing their mind a little bit. Um, we do have a team mom that is and also yoga instructor. So we've been doing yoga once a week live. We get probably about 90% of our team logging in for those every week, which is awesome. You know, just to see everyone's face, say hi for a quick second, and then we get to work. And then we're also doing for our 13 and over, we have daily strength and conditioning things going on. Some of them are live, some of them are on your own at home. And then our 12 and unders usually have like a monthly challenge or something going on like that. So they've been doing really well. And the kids that I've been seeing slowly throughout the last couple of weeks as guidelines have lifted a little bit, you know, they're looking really fit. I had 12 kids in the pool just this week, you know, just working on some technique stuff, going smooth. And they looked a lot better than I thought they were. And I think they felt a lot better than they thought they were going to. That's really great. So I'm interested in two things there. With your live Zoom workouts, how have you found that? Do you, do you find that, I'll tell you that at, at Victor, when we do the live Zoom, I feel like I'm getting better effort than if I was actually there with the athletes. Are you seeing some of that too? Some of that, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, you're always going to have your hard workers that go at it regardless. Um, but I think I'm not exactly sure what it is, if it's just, you know, they're just bored. So they're so excited to work out or, you know, they're online. So they think everyone's staring at them. I have no idea. But yes, I do definitely see some of that. Um, the yoga I'll actually do with the team for the most part. But then I'll kind of check in on the squares, maybe take a picture here and there, you know, and they're all on target crushing it. Um, same thing with, you know, our live strength workouts. Some of them are killer. And, you know, they're just going at it. And one of the little girls, she's 11. She was at our practices this week and she was just crushing push ups. And I don't even know if she could do one or two good ones before quarantine. So that was a plus for sure. Have you noticed, uh, like I have at, at our workout since we've been back, we're, we're not in a pool, we're exclusively open water, but I've noticed that my athletes have gotten so much taller, like, especially. Yeah. Between ages 10 and 14, those kids are like growing like weeds. Have you noticed that too? Absolutely. It, it's crazy. They I just like show a, up, they look like a different person. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I wanted to also ask you, 
as you get back here in Pennsylvania, how many athletes do you, are you allowed to have in the pool? So we are allowed to have, I'm working with a bunch of different rental pools. So a lot of them are still kind of a maybe and we haven't been in the pool. So it's anywhere between one per lane or two per lane. The pool that we actually finally got to start this week is a long course pool. So we're allowed to have six per lane spread out every 10 yards and kind of staggered. Um, so that's going to work out kind of nicely. So we have six lanes, long course, I'll have 36 kids in that pool, which is obviously a lot better than having six in a six lane pool staggered one end and the other. So. We'll Absolutely. See. How have you found the kids have, uh, have they been receptive to the structure and the strategy that you have to employ with, with coronavirus? Are you, do, do they have a set pathway that they have to enter your facility? How are they reacting to some of the social distancing norms now? So for the most part, tomorrow is going to be our first day. So I don't have a clear cut answer on that. This week when I had the 12 athletes, um, you know, they were instructed to wear their mask as they entered the facility. They can take them off, get in the pool. They had their set lane. So I had six kids at the wall and then I had six just past the flags instead of doing every other end because they were still socially distanced and it was just a little bit easier. They could at least chit chat a little bit in between sets and hear me a little bit easier. Um, and they did awesome with that. So it was just something to get used to. And, you know, you think about it for the first couple hundreds, I have to stop outside of the flags, which as a swim coach is hard to tell your kids don't finish to the wall, but yeah, they, they were great. And then this week it'll be a couple more kids. So, you know, we're going to have, I have a couple parents volunteering to help check them in, you know, sign their waivers, things like that, and then enter six feet apart and things like that. So we should that, be. Yeah, that for us has been the hardest thing to make sure to remind them. They're doing a, a pretty good job, but, you know, they, they want to be around their friends and see their friends. And uh, so that that's a challenge. Today, you know, we plan to talk about some games and some fun things and challenges you can do with your team to help keep them motivated throughout your training cycle. And I think it's apropos for me to ask you first that if we were to ask Reese Whitley right now <laughs> what his all time favorite practice was with you at Penn Charter, what do you think he'd say or remember? So I actually asked him that question and he was joking. So his least favorite <laughs> practice was a practice we did on 4th of July. It was, they started with a run. They had to have their bathing suits on under their clothes or whatever they wanted to run in. And then they just <laughs> threw their sneakers off and they had four 1200s. Um, there was something set, but then a few of the athletes had something more specific. Like kids probably had a little bit more I am and brushstroke in it. So it was all like laid out exactly what they needed to do. And he was like, yeah, that was not fun. Um, but then I, we were talking a little bit and he was like, you know, I like practices where you give me something really tough, but then I crush it. <laughs> so he enjoyed practices that he did really well with. And two that we were talking about was one was a sprint brushstroke set where he had to hold a 27.4 or faster in 50s brushstroke. I believe they were on the 120 or he had to do a hundred fly. So if he went above a 27.4 in the 50, his next 50 was now a 100 fly. So he obviously had some motivation to not do any of those hundreds fly. Um, and he made all of them. So he wasn't sure of himself going into the set. But once we got into it, he was crushing it. And that was fun. So when you say 12 or four 1200s, that's like that's Mike Murray's jam. That's where we <laughs> like to live. Um, and can you tell me a little bit about you know, the, the run swim set, like, was it, is it a challenge that you planned? How far did they run? And then how did they jump into that set? So on, on holidays, we usually don't have off. So I like to do, I mean, it's always fun for me. <laughs> it depends on the kid if they think it's fun or not. Um, so like 4th of July, Halloween, even Thanksgiving morning, we have practice, just a tradition. Everyone loves it. Um, so on those holiday practices and they don't necessarily know what's coming, 
but they know it's going to be something a little bit different. And I think we ran a mile. It was just kind of run out the door, run to our track, which is behind just on the field. So they just ran a mile on the track, ran back in through their stuff and then jumped into whatever lane and whatever their 1200s were that day. And I think in between the 1200s, it might've been like 10 push ups just to kind of break it up a little bit. <laughs> I think that's awesome. You know, laying down some challenges like that, yep. uh, I think it really prepares them for success, not just inside of that season, but for later on. Um, we did a set uh, a couple years ago with specific athletes who we knew could handle it. We went six 1200 IMs, descend one to three, four to six. And not everybody can handle that. And my yeah. daughter just said from the kitchen, I remember that day. Um, not everybody can handle that. But I think when they get through something like that, what are they ever going to see for the rest of their career that's going to be as tough as that? Yeah. You know, I, I, I really love that. And it's it's part playing games and having fun and, and doing challenges with your athletes, our topic for today. I think that that kind of stuff is absolutely fun. Yeah. And, uh, and and the kids, even though it's really hard, I think they see things like that that are fun. Um, and that that breaststroke set that you had Reese do, where if he missed one, he had to do a, a hundred fly. How many strokes is Reese taking at race speed? Twenty five yards. Breaststroke. Yeah. Uh, we want him to take five, but he's very good at taking three and four, so. That was a huge change from his maybe sophomore year of high school into junior and senior year because he was struggling getting up to speed. He's awesome at underwaters and walls and he's quick off of his walls. But, you know, at six foot nine, it's hard to kind of get going. Um, so that was one of our things, like getting into that breakout, really snapping into that first stroke and trying to take as many strokes as possible, which, again, is a weird thing to hear from a swim coach sometimes. But that was definitely a focus for him that year. So I think he was typically on that set going four and then trying to get five on the way back. So you're trying to accelerate that engine with that, that higher stroke count. I see that, especially with an athlete who's as long as him and it might take him a little bit longer to get those arms and legs moving. Yeah. I will, I will tell you that one of the most impressive things I've seen as an age group coach, I was standing on deck at Ohio state juniors a couple of years ago, winter juniors at Ohio state and 200 IM that night in finals, he went 142. Um, and I said, we all knew this kid was going to be good, but that swim, you know, to, to take people's focus kind of off of the unbelievable breaststroke times that he was putting up. All right. Now he's got the whole package. Can you talk a little bit about even when he started to have really next level success in breaststroke, why that IM was so important? So we, I would talk to coaches all the time Reese doesn't really love to just train breaststroke all the time. There are breaststrokers out there that are like, they just want more and more breaststroke because um, that's their jam. But he's also good at all the other strokes. So he likes to mix up that, um, that training. So that wasn't too hard to get out of him. And then again, it just challenges another set that reason I talked about the other day was we would do 175 IMs on think we would usually put them on 230 um but you had to go your best time or faster so it would be 50 fly 50 back 50 breast 25 free you have to hold under your best time ever um again i think it was one of those where you know like in the moment he hated it but then at the end of the day it's like you leave feeling accomplished like that was super hard but i did it <laughs> it's oh, over no you know the next 200 i am i race piece of cake. And is he the type of athlete, it looks like to me, that when you step up those challenges, he's ready to take it to the next level until he accomplishes it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it might be a look, like a lot of looks like, are you crazy? And then, <laughs> but I mean, he'll go after it. So, you know, he's always sure. going to see what he has and he knows that I'm not just going to be easy on him. And he just right. did it. So we, you know, we, we've been fortunate to have some really talented athletes. Um, and, and I think one, one of the points that Chuck Bassler brought up in our first episode was 
we're not always going to have the Reese Whitley's of the world on our team. We're incredibly fortunate to have those types of swimmers, but it's not always going to happen. I think it's fair to say that most coaches are trying to find ways when they're writing their workouts to make the material enjoyable in a, in a certain way. We know it's not always going to be enjoyable, but to make it more fun. Do you think that in doing that, it's going to help motivate them to reach new goals. If we're thinking a little bit more outside the box about traditional training and, and what that entails, and then adding something in the middle of practice where you stop everybody and you say, hey, we're going to have an underwater kick speed contest to 15 meters, or, hey, we're going to do a, a big cannonball off the blocks into a sprint 25. Do you think things like this motivate the athletes to take their training to the next level? Yeah, Absolutely. And I think some coaches may hear, some swimmers may hear fun and games. And it's like, you know, the top level athletes find it fun to, you know, crush a challenging set. So it doesn't have to be the longest, hardest set. But, you know, <laughs> really taking a sprint set seriously, we have 25s on a minute. Obviously, everyone can make that. But it's, you know, what are you putting into it? Because if you leave practice that day knowing you gave it you know 80 percent. it was good i didn't get yelled at it was fine you know you didn't get a lot out of that day so every challenge and i set a lot of expectations in practice so they know you know what what am i doing in this set it's not just laps and yards on a on a set it's just you know everything has a, something specific that they want to get out of it you know, I, I try to find a quotable quote for every one of these when we post our show notes and, and you're already there within 13 minutes of us being on. And that that is top level athletes find a way to make things fun. Is that something that was true of Reese? And, and maybe you have a story that you can can share about that. Yeah, I probably have a million. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of my athletes right now actually comes to mind. We have. I coach high school also. So one of the other coaches, he mm -hmm. coaches country club and high school and water polo, and he just does everything. So he'll see someone doing really well in my group and he'll be like, what is that? <laughs> I'm like, that's going 10 meters with their head down at the end of a freestyle set or end of 50 free or whatever it is. And I'm like, that's not a drill. That's, you know, what they should be doing. But some kids are just like, Oh, like, that kid did it once. I'm like, no, you're supposed to be doing that all of the time. <laughs> right. um, so he's like, do that crystal thing. I'm like finishing with your head down and not breathing in the flags. If you want to call it a crystal thing, sure. But really <laughs> that's the expectation for all freestyle sets. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and let's say we're talking about when Reese and I don't want to keep going back to him, but it's just, he was one of the most dominant age group swimmers I ever saw. Um, when he was in practice and he started to uh, develop more and more over the course of time, was he actively seeking out challenges from you? Yeah, he was very much so a sponge. So not necessarily challenges because I feel like I was throwing that at him all the time, but he was really good at, you know, asking why, why this and why that and why am I changing my technique and not in a negative way whatsoever, just knowing like, okay, I understand the challenge. I'm going to go after it. What exactly are, are we working on? You know what I mean? Is it for the end of my IM? Is it just for speed? Is it, you know, what exactly do you want me to get out of this set while I'm holding this ridiculous time that you asked me to hold? <laughs> That's awesome. We, we mentioned that, you know, sometimes on Thanksgiving break or Christmas, you do things. At, at Victor, every year, we, we have this thing we call the Mountain Dew Challenge, and it's a 25 underwater kick with fins for time. It's, uh, you know, 100 free with fins and paddles racing. So we do some fun things like that, but it ends in a Mountain Dew chugging relay, which is pretty outrageous, <laughs> uh, but they love it. Is there any particular day, let's say within a month, where you're planning something like that, where the team knows it's not necessarily going to be pound, 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 but we're going to have some fun today and, and Coach Crystal is going to open up the playbook? We do. 
we have done the Gatorade challenge on Thanksgiving. It's kind of a oh, nice. Gatorade challenge in these three lanes. You let me know if you're doing that part or there's another set in the other part of the pool, um, which they love to do. It's mostly the guys <laughs> that are participating in that. Um, but yeah, it's that, you know, race, Gatorade, race, Gatorade, race, Gatorade, race, Gatorade. Um, and then, you know, the kids that are on the other side of the pool doing whatever set they have for that day find it funny to, you know, like they're working hard. But then during the intervals that they have some rest, they're looking over like, what number are you on? Are you making the time? <laughs> so we do exactly. we do goal times for those races and things like that. So it's fun. We usually have a bunch of college swimmers that come back for that day. Um so it's just a nice mix of, you know, seeing some old teammates, doing something fun. The ones that sign up and want to do that part of the Gatorade challenge, you know, they know it's coming. And even the ones that aren't doing it know that it's going to be funny. So. And it's great that they get a chance to do it with their friends, the alumni from your program. I think, you know, there's so much that could be said for that uh, in, in on every team, how important it is for your alumni to come back. Is that something that, that you are, you're making sure you're staying in contact with your alumni for these, these practices? Are you sending out any alumni newsletters? How do you engage that part of your Penn Charter community? Um, we are a pretty small team. So when the kids graduate, I'm usually keeping in touch with, you know, like what dual meets you have coming up? What are you doing in practice? Have, do you have any fun sets? Things like that. Just kind of checking in on them. And, you know, those Christmas practices and that Thursday morning for Thanksgiving, they're usually checking in even before I do because, you know, they're excited they're coming home and, you know, they want to see everyone, which is fun. So we have great alumni. And sometimes even when they're graduating from college, they'll stop in by practice. They're like, I'm not getting in, but I want to see everyone and just kind of <laughs> hang out on deck. So that's always fun around the holidays. It just brings in so much of the culture of who you are and, and what the team is all about. And I think it's so incredibly important. Um, are there any days, this is a really popular question. Are there any days where it's about play at Penn Charter Aquatic Club? So when you and I first talked, and I know a little bit of your background and I know how hard you work the athletes. You said, I was talking to some of my athletes today about our topic and they said well <laughs> we certainly don't play a lot but we work hard and it's fun uh do you ever do any water polo or sharks or minnows or any of that kind of stuff I, I i'll be honest with you when i was really a young coach i never did any of that stuff um but as i've kind of grown into what my role is in the athletes lives i know that uh sometimes and it's rare and my athletes who are watching this are probably like this is so not true but <laughs> We, we do play water polo on occasion. We do do some fun things, some fun sets. And I find that the speed, the effort, and the attitude are some of the best speed, effort, and attitude I get all year. Do you guys do anything like that? Yeah, so we, we like whiffs. So we'll work some underwaters and things like that. Sometimes make it a team thing. Um, during Christmas training, we did play alligator in a diving well that was really deep so it was really hard because you could go deep if you wanted to so the people chasing and the people going underwater were both you know very tired um and then you're just trying to get them because we also did a time limit so they didn't have a lot of rest in between so some of them were like i just can't get out of the pool fast enough for the next one uh so that was a lot of fun and yeah you see i mean they're using their underwaters because they want to win um and then obviously breath control, huge into that. I am huge into cannonball contests. So cannonball contests, you know, into a sprint, just a straight up cannonball contest. Um, we're big on get out swim. So every once in a while, I mean, they may ask for one, but they're not always going to get it. But, you know, every once in a while, they just look fast and I'll just throw it out there. And I say, I stop the set throw it out there and I say four people have to come back from this hundred easy and volunteer or we're going round three. And then they're all kind of like looking <laughs> at each other as they're swimming that hundred easy. <laughs> and you know, they usually swim really fast. So that's always fun. And then they're like, you know, does it have to be two out of four of us? Does it have to be all four of us? 
So again, it's fast swimming within those games. We're not always just playing water polo and things like that. I do have a lot of kids that play water polo during the varsity season. So I probably could incorporate that a little bit more, but I have not. <laughs> I have found that water polo is so much explosive movement. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great thing to throw out there in the middle of some of our toughest training cycles when I'm watching and I'm just saying they are shot. Like I, I, I got to break this up. And if I don't, it's just going to be a slog and negative. And so the, the water polo has, has really come to their aid more than it has mine. But you mentioned some really cool things that, that you're doing there, like some of those cannonballs into a sprint. I think uh, a phrase that Mark Kessy says to me all the time is, Mike, you, you need to work on your athlete's physical literacy. Um, they, they, and then Chris uh, Plum and Ian Murray, when I had them on, they were talking about creating pro movement problems for their athletes to solve. And I thought that that was such an unbelievably uh, positive way of looking at incorporating some different things to mix up the training. Um, and it sounds like, you guys are doing that there. Can you tell me what is alligator so that I now have a new game to play? Is it like sharks and so minnows? alligator? Basically, I believe it pretty much is sharks and minnows, but you have to drag the person up. So you obviously nice. you need to <laughs> make sure that you're really clear on the rules of how we're dragging this human up to the surface. And then once they're up, you just have to tag their head. So like if you kind of drag them and then they're getting away, it doesn't count. So it's not just the touch. So there's a lot of officiating happening yeah. too from Coach Chris on that yeah, game. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Uh, what types of practice challenges or games did you experience as a young athlete? And, and how has that maybe influenced your philosophy in regard to making workouts more interesting for the kids? I honestly – other than maybe seventh grade and under, I don't remember playing games. Um, I had coaches that were more just, you know, hard work and sets repeated a little bit more often than maybe you wanted to. So, I mean, there's something to be said for that. You know what you did with eight 100s free last week and you want to be faster this week and the next week and on week 12 and on week 20. Um, but I'm not a big repeater. You know, they'll say pieces of sets certain days or like, I remember the last time we did something like this. Um, but as far as repeating sets, I'm not big on that. So I think that's where they kind of, you know, stay on their toes a little bit. They don't really know what's coming on Tuesdays. It's usually threshold free ish. So they know it's going to be mostly freestyle. Um so they kind of know what's coming, but as far as the set, if it's going to be a little bit more focused on speed, all threshold, you know, are we doing hundreds, two hundreds, whatever that might be, they're not sure on that because it's not always the same test set or things like that. When you mention, um, you know, your days are mixed up, is there days that are there days where they know that today is threshold, today is sprint? Today, we're going to be doing lactate. Do you have a set schedule? Can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, for sure. So on Mondays, we're a little bit more heavy on kick. Tuesdays, they usually have, you know, at least a threshold free set. On Wednesdays, we are a mix of IM and racing. So like some lactate stuff. Thursdays is typically our prime day. So they're doing their main stroke. Fridays is usually what the week looked like. So if they're looking awesome or, you know, if something was just a little bit off, what do we need to work on on Friday, you know, just to kind of complete that week. And then Saturdays we always start off with an Ironman. So that is usually a big long warm up, and then it's an Ironman. So again, it might be a sprint Ironman. It might be a bunch of rounds. It might be one giant long Ironman where it's a mix of dry land and swimming. So, you know, it might be, 30 push-ups, dive in for a 400 free, 20 push-ups, dive in for a 400 IM, 10 push-ups, dive in for whatever's coming next. Or, you know, it might be a bunch of 50s and like quick dry land and, you know, a minute plank and things like that. So I think that's kind of fun. They know it's coming. It's always going to be hard. They work hard. 
And I think that's something awesome because it's not on an interval. So you don't technically have to work hard to get it done. You just have to do it. But everyone's being timed. You know, they know who their typical competitor is that's usually close to them. So they usually keep an eye on each other, which I love. And, you know, if you have that sprint where someone's really good at dry land versus someone that's good at longer distances swim, you know, you'll see the sprinters. They're like, yes, there's more dry land <laughs> swimming and I'm getting in and out so I can beat these other kids that usually beat me on the longer stuff. So it's fun. And then I usually post, you know, the top three kids or maybe the top three girls, top three guys. Depends on the week. Um, but I don't think that they're working hard just for the post. It's just pride at that point. You know, I'm so that like that response it was so great because it really ties into our topic today. It's creating challenges, right? And you're mixing things together on a Saturday. It sounds a little bit like old school Schulberg stuff. You know, if you ever went to the old Germantown Academy pool, he had two lanes. He called them lane seven and eight that were all VASA trainers or dry land equipment. Yeah. And he was incorporating stuff back and forth. Um, but it really is different than what a lot of their expectation of a Saturday practice may have been before they were on your team. For a lot of clubs and a lot of teams, Saturday is they know that they're going to get their butts kicked. But if I'm going to get my butt kicked and it's different than just banging out yardage, I think I'm going to walk away from that practice feeling like I really accomplished something. I did something different with my teammates and it was fun. Like there's no reason. And you said this earlier, when athletes hear fun, they think easy. Yeah. You know, there's no reason why fun can't be really hard work. And I think when you combine that dry land and we talked about it earlier too, with the, the 1200s, which I love, I'm actually going <laughs> to, I'm actually going to email you after this and I want to get, all of I want to get the details of that. And set. then I'll send um, an apology to your swimmers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we'll put it in the show notes and it'll be great <laughs> for people to see. But, but um, when you're incorporating some of that dry land is, is that Saturday kind of looking the same throughout the season? And, and how do you take a, uh, a practice like that and adapt it when you start to rest? Does the dry land disappear how are you resting with that work? Yeah, so again, since they're kind of used to that Ironman, sometimes when we're leading into taper, you know, that minute plank may stay there, but then the push-ups or whatever turn into a shoulder stretch or leg swings or something where they're just kind of like actively recovering or stretching. So they're still kind of getting in and out. It might just be more of like an Ironman warm-up when we're about to rest. So they're still, you know, getting in some long swims or that pre-meet warm up. but then we're adding in those dry land pieces and parts of our stretch routine and things like that, just to, you know, break it up, keep it a little bit interesting. You know, when you're eight days on taper and you're doing the same exact thing, <laughs> it's good for routine, but then, you know, just to keep it a little bit more fresh. Um, and, you know, that might come on a Wednesday also, if it, just fits into what's coming up. I wanted to talk about it earlier because you mentioned it. And I think it's such a important part of challenging your athletes and keeping things fun. Let's talk for a few minutes about get out swims. I have seen some pretty remarkable get out swim performances, um, not just on my teams, but there was one time I was visiting the University of Florida and it was not a get out swim, but Coach Troy treats it as such with the energy that he expects from the yeah. athletes. You can stop the entire main set, choose one person and say, you're going to 200 free all out right now. Let's see what you got. And the kid fires. They could be having the worst practice, but they know the expectation inside of what he's doing yep. there. And they will fire up and give you something really, really impressive. Um, when you're going to give a get out swim, you said, when I'm watching practice and I see that they're really moving, as a coach, you're like, holy cow, you know what? This last set, we might get something out of it, but how cool would it be if I created this scenario where so-and-so becomes the practice hero, right? There's a component of that, too. You're having an athlete, maybe you know they're going through a tough week. Give them the chance to get their teammates out of practice. Can you talk about... What goes into your mindset when you decide that you're going to get it, going to have a get out swim? Not just simply the athletes look good. 
which is important. But I, I want to hear how your brain thinks, just so I can justify my own <laughs> reasons why I do. I would say I have never gone into a practice thinking I'm going to throw a get out swim out there. Um, <laughs> but again, it might be, you know, the whole team looks awesome. So I'm like, all right, I've gotten enough out of this where if the get out swim happens, I'm going to be okay with it. Cause there are certain times where they look really good. And I'm like, I just can't, I can't stop it. Yeah. <laughs> it stuff keep going. Yeah. Um, or, you know, it might be a kid where I'm just like, I don't know. It just seems to be having an off day, but I know that there's speed in there. It might be a kid that looks good in practice, but I know that they get freaked out at meets. So let's put them in this weird scenario where they, <laughs> it, it's a little nerve wracking, but it's all their teammates. It's their safe space. You know, it's not the end of the world. If you don't get it, we just get back in and go. Um, so there's a bunch of different scenarios where that might happen. And again, it might be one kid or it might be four kids or sometimes I pick a kid and then others might be like, can I go? Like maybe they feel fast and I just didn't pick them that day. And they're like, I think I can crush whatever's coming up. So I think that's cool also when, you know, they'll kind of volunteer themselves to, either have some moral support for their friend or whatever it might be. So I always think that's fun. And I do have a funny story about a get out swim. Let's, let's go for so, it. So Reese had a get out swim and it was the only time that I lied and told him that he did not get it. I have never lied ever to a swimmer or him ever. <laughs> He, I forget, I don't think it was a great practice. He was just kind of like doing a good job, um, but his stroke looked good. So I was like, everybody stop, Reese on the blocks, you have to go. Oh, I forget what he had to go. I think he had to go a 54-2, let's say, 100 the breast middle, strokes, 54-2, 100 breasts. We had like 35 minutes left of practice. So he gets up and he goes 53 4. And I was like 54 3 because I needed him to finish the practice. <laughs> because I think he yeah. I think he had just gone on a college recruiting trip or something. So he had like a day or two off. And I was like, I really just need him to finish this practice. So I lied and then I told him later and he was so mad. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, did he ever find out about I did that? tell him. It was a really hilarious scenario. We, I think we were driving to maybe finals at a pro series meet, and his mom was in the car, and I told him, and he was like, what? And I was like, if you're mad at me, just take it out on finals. And he just laughed. He's like, That's you're it. crazy. I saw that um, you also, when, when you have those Ironman workouts, you post the results of the top three. Yeah. Are kids, are kids vying to get on that top three posting? Yeah. Yeah. They're like, so it, they'll slide out of the pool. I have one kid that literally throws his body on the ground because he doesn't want to take a lot of time transitioning from pool to ground. And he's just like slides across right into his push ups. Like, whatever you got to do, bud. Just to get in that top three. I mean, he just wants to go oh. fast, but yeah, yeah, he would love to win too. And is that is that posted on the pool deck? Is it on the website? How do they get access to it? It is sometimes just posted on the window. Sometimes I post it on my Instagram. So again, it's not. I don't keep it exactly the same because I don't want it to turn into. I just want to be on Instagram, even though if they're working, that's right. cool. But you know, I try to teach the kids like we're not. We're not racing for the pink ribbon. We're racing to race and have fun and go after best times and learn from all your races. Have you noticed about that? Inst I, I have a lot of athletes who will quote me and say, Coach Mike, will this, will this performance on our lactate set today since it was so good? Is it going on the gram? <laughs> it's going on the gram. Man. It's all about the gram. And I do yeah, it is. I do a lot of posting for our for our team, obviously, and, and a lot of social media in general for for our business. But kids are always like, "Is this going the grand? You going <laughs> the grand?" Oh my gosh. Um, do you have any practice records that you use to motivate the kids? Or is there any is there any set that they know? You know, maybe 
over the course of the history of, of Penn Charter, like we know that so-and-so did this on this set and we want to beat it. Do you have anything like yeah, that? Yeah, so if we if we have a test set, that will go up on the wall. It might be, you know, they might see it once every 10 days, every 14 days just for that season. Or I tell them, you know, we're going to do this four times in the next two months or whatever it might be. And then we also have team records for our weird events, which is 500 backstroke, 400 breaststroke, 300 fly, or the 500 IM. This is awesome. So <laughs> you have, tell me that again. I'm actually taking notes here. So you have, start that again. You have records for, for our weird events, which okay. they may see at any given point. And it is a 500 backstroke or a 400 breaststroke or a 300 fly or a 500 IM. Some years it's a 600 IM. So I have records for both of those. Wow. And so they're able to access what the fastest times are on those sets. Yeah, they're just on our bulletin board. And last year I had I had two of my swimmers throughout the season go from a 500 IM all the way up to 1,000. So one week they did a 6, then a 7, then an 8, then a 9, then a 10. That's so cool. So – are, are the kids asking you, when are we going to get another opportunity to get after that? Uh, I think I usually let it go long enough that they kind of, they, they're they never expecting it. And mm -hmm. then when they see it, they're just like, here we go. <laughs> That's really cool. And is, are they proud when it's their name that has the fastest time? Is that something that, you know, is getting them excited? Yes. Yeah. And when it's not the best flyer that gets the fly record, you know, the flyer is not usually very excited. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to own his event. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah. So I'll have female records and male records. And sometimes I'll just have a random t-shirt. I'm like, you guys really like this t-shirt or sweatshirt that I got the last pro series meet fastest three fly today. Not doesn't have to be the record. Fast three fly today. Get that. They're like, sweatshirt <laughs> oh yeah i mean that's uh, absolutely the, the, those types of motivators i think are important you know a lot of people kind of stray away from that this day and age but but i i think it's it's important to have those things every once in a while you know it it, it motivates a kid to do something that maybe they didn't think they were capable of yeah. doing so that's who doesn't like a free t-shirt awesome. <laughs> so we we do have i told you if i see something that catches my eye in the chat box and I love talking. I'll talk training with you all day. Um, Carl is asking, is it straight I am on those sets or is there, is there any I am free? It's straight up. Straight I am. Up. It's awesome. It's so great. And when those sets are happening, uh, are, are parents at, at practice at all or is it just coaches? We, uh, there... we have open practices. So there are some kids that drive an hour so those parents usually are up in the balcony just kind of chit-chatting. I don't really pay attention. I would say maybe we have like 12 parents up there on a given day. But So do they know about those those sets? On sets like that, I'm sure the parents know when the kids are like, oh, and make a huge loud noise, <laughs> or they get excited right. about something, but otherwise they're probably not watching. <laughs> I, I was really excited to ask you this today, and it's probably a question that I'm going to start asking every guest. But in your opinion, what college program do you think is having the most fun? I know that UVA posts the, mo the most, and I really like Tyler and Todd. Um, yep. I keep in touch with Reese, obviously, at Cal, um, a swim in our area that is now at Texas, so he'll send me – he loves sending me sets and he'll send me like what he did on them or, you know, I did terrible on this set, but it was really cool or I crushed this set. So those are the three teams that I see the most that seem to be, you know, having fun, doing hard sets, think like the Texas sets again. And I've talked to Eddie Reese about it where, you know, it might be a certain expectation. And he says, you know, even if it's a mediocre expectation where he just, you know, it's more show count or whatever. And he's like, they end up racing each other because it's just in their nature and they can't help themselves. So, you know, they might be going eight seconds faster than Eddie even said they had to. 
And I love that. I've, I've heard about that and uh, I've been fortunate to see some of that. Um, one of the things that I started doing about four years ago with our coaching staff is we do something very similar to the Eddie Reese invite. Okay. And the first time I saw that Eddie Reese invite, I think uh, Mike McBroom swam the 2000 freestyle for time. It was something ridiculously fast in the 17s. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then Joe Schooling did 150 fly. That was ridiculously fast. And then I, I thought to myself, why, why don't I do this like a week out of our season culminating meet? Yeah. Just put up a couple 75s, 150s, distances that aren't going to get inside their head. Uh, do you do anything like that at Penn Charter? Do you set anything up like that where the kids might? We actually put on suits now. And for the longest time, I was like, I'm never using suits in practice. We're not doing any of that. Um, do you ever do anything like that? Suit up and do some odd distance racing? Yeah, so that we'll do it suited and unsuited. I'm huge on 125s and 75s. They know their best times. You know, they know their best time, their best 75 breaststroke in season, best 75 you know, right for a meet, they know it, they're, you know, working to obviously hit that or be faster. Um, you know, my 200 flyers, 125s fly, you know, they'll know their best times. And then we might do a suit up Saturday, usually just because we have more time and it, you know, they don't have to get to bed. Um, where I let them suit up and it's a 30 minute open warm up. You do you, you stretch before, after, you know, set yourself up for success. And then they either, I either tell them what they're racing or there are certain opportunities where they're signing up for exactly what they want to race. So it could be something weird like the 300 fly, or it could be a 125 free. It could be the 200 backstroke. So, you know, they know what's com coming up either way, if they're signing up or I'm signing them up. I love it. And we actually, we're going to have an episode on the coach's corner in three weeks about suited upsets. Mm -hmm. We have a special guest for that. Who's going to tell us a lot about suiting, suiting up in practice and racing. Um, I think that for us, it, it kind of gets the first swim almost out of the way for the next week's championship. You know, for a lot of my athletes over the course of the years, I don't know if it was me or if it was something, we always struggled the first mm -hmm. day especially at summer juniors, because summer juniors, man, you, you better be ready in the morning. I feel like it's harder to make it back top eight at summer juniors sometimes than it is to get back at national prelims is I mean, finals. You, that's our motto. hundred percent like, for summer. Juniors. I don't care who you are. Prelims is finals when you're at a big meet. Cause if you're supposed to be in the a final and you end up in the C final, that's annoying. Yeah. Absolutely. Or, or not getting another yeah. swim in summer. Juniors, it brings out the best in our athletes. And so I, I started to think once they got past that first day, they were going to, they were lighting it up. It's almost like they had to plug into the energy of the meat. And I found that doing some of these, uh, you know, like the Eddie Reese, the Eddie Reese invite a couple days before our meet, we even did one a couple of years ago where it was two days before our meet, just two swims. 75 yards or less yep. fast. And when they saw their split times, first of all, they can't panic if it's bad, right? Because what does it mean? It's a yeah. 70, it doesn't mean it. And then the second thing is, holy cow, I was really fast. So but we've been doing that too. And I, I, I'm really interested in that. Um, when, and, and I, you know, I, we can't help talk about Reese because he, you just did such a phenomenal job with him. Um, are there things that you did with him in preparation of big meets that you knew he was going to excel at to give him confidence? And, and how did you play that game with him to create that fun scenario that you knew he would knock out of the park uh, to give him a little confidence? Because at a young age, he was in some top A, a final heats with probably some of his heroes. So can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the things you did to prepare him better? Yeah, I think when he was younger, you know, 11, 12, even maybe 13 also, even though he had had a couple national age group records, you know, 
he wasn't overthinking things. So it, we didn't have to change a lot. It was just like, this is the plan. We're ready to roll. And then it, it kind of sucks where kids get a little bit smarter or older or more mature, but it's not necessarily the greatest thing because then they, they know exactly what they went on certain sets and things like that. And if they don't do that 10 days out from a meet, they think, you know, the world is ending or something like that. So, you know, mixing it up and just kind of reading your athletes, if they're ready to roll, you just kind of go with your plan. If you feel like you need to mix it up because they're getting in their head or, you know, maybe they just need to do a 75 fast from the block just to see you're fast. We're good to go. <laughs> Stick with the plan. Then you just throw them up on the block. Uh, Reese usually had a suit in his bag. So, you know, an old suit, you just kind of slip it on. And again, at six foot nine, 240 pounds, a suit does a little bit for you. So, you know, working on those breakouts and making sure you can feel those also. Sometimes in long course, we might do a zinger right from the block just to kind of make sure that that feel of the breakout was there, see where the speed was, if it's stroke tell out. Me, tell, me about the that? tell me what the, tell me what the zinger so is. So a full 50 all out race at a meet, you know, one or two days out, suit up and warm up and you go for it. Just make sure the stroke counts there and things like that. Cause with him again, it might be, you know, okay, you can do a 50, holding three strokes on both laps and go 28s, which seems pretty fast for 50s breaststroke repeat, but a 28.0 versus a 27.3 is a huge difference. So if you have to take those extra strokes and that's the way to get there, that's what you need to do. Uh, we had an athlete, her first international meet before the first day of the competition uh, and this was a genius move by, by Braden Holloway. He had her do 150 fly the day before the 400 IM. And it was so fast that in her mind, there was no way that she was going to miss out on the opportunity. It just got rid of the first swim meet international jitters. Yep. And then, then you're right into racing. And I think that's so important. So when you said zinger, I had an idea of what it was. And now I know it's exactly what a lot of great coaches do. I love it. I, I think it's so important to give the athlete the, the opportunity to feel fast. I think some coaches we call it a stinger, but I think zinger is fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. We actually have, uh, in my opinion, one of the best age group coaches in the country who's, who's on this right now in Washington, just sent a great question, John Fadina from Asphalt Green in New York City. He's asking, how do you develop age group swimmers, nine to 14 years old, into successful senior swimmer? You, you arguably have done that as well as anyone. So what are some of the things you think were, were really important in the development of, of your highest level athletes? I think they need to know their body. So as they're growing, staying on top of technique, changing stroke counts, you know, knowing your stroke count, but then also being aware that stroke count is going to change, um, body line stuff, tight core, making them aware of how they're supposed to feel in the water. I think it's huge because when you're, you know, getting a 14 year old that transfers from another club to your club and you're basically scarting from ground zero, like they never sculled and they don't know what high hips means. They don't know what, you know, picking up your kick or building in a race, you know, it's never really been there. That's hard. So when you get to develop those swimmers and you get them when they're eight, nine, 10 years old, I think really working on body positioning and things like that is huge. Um, we're huge on stroke technique and by no means are we specializing at all during those ages. So, you know, we want to be good at everything we want to be as good as possible as you can be at every event so working on everything absolutely and can you talk about how easy these athletes make it look when they get to the level of finaling at national championships and we both know that there are so many pitfalls and failures and times where we might have even heard them say, I don't want to do this. Can you talk about maybe some of the things that, that you've done in, in your coaching career to help alleviate that athlete's stress, help them identify it and, and 
for a lot of them, for a lot of the athletes that have come through our program, I have to tell them how important it is for them to really feel the feelings that they have. Because so many times they hear, oh, suck it up, get tough, all this kind of stuff. Can you talk a little bit about what you've had to do to help keep your athletes on track towards the goals that they know, that you know they have, but sometimes aren't willing to live inside that goal? I think a huge part is my athletes know that I care about them. So, you know, when they come to me and they're feeling a certain way, I validate that. So, you know, they know that I'm not going to take them just complaining, but I'm pretty good at reading my athletes. So, you know, if Reese were to come up from school that day, I can read immediately what kind of day he had. So, you know, it just might be, a chit chat real quick or, you know, the other faces. I know he just needs to warm up and he'll be totally fine because, you know, eight minutes into warm up, <laughs> he might have a sour puss on his face and then he's giggling with his teammates. Um, so reading the athletes, getting to know them and letting them know, you know, you actually care about them. You know what their goals are. You care how their day was just kind of talking to them. And I think that also kind of goes into you know, you read articles on coaches having favorites. And I'm like, the favorites are the kids that are there early. You get to know them. They want to be there. You want them there. You know, you can't get to know your athletes that are constantly running in seven minutes late. I can't ask you how your day was when you're late all the time. And so you're not going to get to know them. They're not going to get to know you as much. Um, so I think that plays into it as well. Absolutely. It's it's so important to establish that relationship. And every coach that we've had on the webinar on Coach's Corner has talked about that. No matter what our topic has been, it always circles back to knowing your athletes better. In understanding uh, contemporary coaching, we have so many more tools than we've ever had. For my athletes, when I get the buckets out or the stretch cords, uh, they know it's going to be a fun workout, even though you and I both know if, if you're doing repeats on a stretch cord, it's one of the hardest things to do. Yeah. Can you talk about the use of toys in your program at Penn Charter? Yeah. I call them toys. <laughs> yep, for sure. So we have – we had power <laughs> racks. They didn't do well on our pool deck. They got very rusty. So we have – buckets now we have um we have parachutes that we use a lot you know the normal fins paddles buoys snorkels and things like that sprint group is using toys a lot <laughs> so mm -hmm. in the morning at morning practice we have a little bit more space so the sprinters really make it a point to make sure that they're getting there for those morning practices where it's specifically sprint for them, you know, and it might be eight different sprint groups kind of just like mixing in together, which I think is fun. And then Saturdays, we have a little bit more time also. So after that Ironman, we might go into groups. So it might be, you know, a fin kick set in lanes one and two in the middle, they're doing cords. So they're using partners to kind of pull back and forth. You know, are we working on speed or getting as many strokes as possible? Just kind of depends on the day. And then we have the buckets in lanes five and six so that will be the same kind of thing where you know we're working on max number of strokes at a medium weight or we're trying to go five strokes as fast as possible and then they have kind of peer review so i'll be working working with all of the groups kind of walking around and things like that with my assistant coaches and then when they're in those groups they're used to you know that's my partner so i'm going to let him know you know he was lifting his head and things like that so there's a little bit of peer review also which i think they find fun and same thing with the peer review you know if there's extra kids in the group they might be holding a plank while these two kids are partnered up doing the stretch cords and then they kind of have this little rotation within the big rotation of that day so you know the simple fact of using toys that is fun regardless of how hard it is and then also doing stations so we know as hard as this might be we're switching in 16 minutes or 14 minutes or whatever it might be which is i think just mentally a little bit of a break right exactly i have a question on buckets sure. um, 
I'm just starting to use them a little bit, but I'm always worried, especially with the developing athletes in my, in my senior group on our national group. Um, when do you think is a good time to know when they're physically ready to get after buckets? I'm always worried about shoulders um, with developing athletes. I have used buckets exclusively for underwater kick, but what are some factors that you use to determine whether or not an athlete is ready to use those resources? So our athletes don't use buckets unless they're in our strength and conditioning program also. That is awesome. And can you tell us a little bit about your strength and conditioning program? Yeah. So at Penn Trader, we're lucky enough to have a strength and conditioning coach. So he works with the school. A lot of our athletes go to Penn Trader, which is great. But we have a 6 a.m. lift session in the morning, typically on Mondays and Wednesdays, um, where, you know, they're in before all the other teams. So we have that access to him. And he he started working with Reese at the end of eighth grade, and he's continued to work with our team all the way through. So we'll do usually about six weeks, a training cycle during preseason. So September into October, where we're going three lifts a week and no double swims. And then we transfer that to the rest of the winter. They're doing two lifts per week. And then it just depends on the kid and the group that they're in, you know, if they're doing a double or how many doubles they're doing as far as swimming. So when it's lift, I don't, it's not necessarily a double. We just only have the opportunity to lift in the morning. So it just is what it is. So it's just kind of, we just call that lift and then doubles or when we're swimming two times in a day. And how much communication are you having with the strength and conditioning coach about the types of things that you want your athletes to improve? So for me, I'm constantly trying to think about what types of movement problems to solve that I can give the, the kids. Um, how much interaction do you have with that coach? Constant. So, you know, if there's a day where I'm like, we are doing a ridiculous kick Wednesday morning should not be legs or just, I mean, something as simple as that or as complex as, you know, this girl's having a little bit of a shoulder issue. I'm not sure what it is. You know, we just want to keep an eye on it. She might be sore, but, you know, we're going to keep an eye on certain movements. We might take certain movements out of those rotations for that day just to see if, you know, rest works, you know, and then we'll just get right back into it if there's no issues, things like that. He's also just constantly you know, listening to podcasts and things like that. So with Reese, that was his first swimmer at a high level that he was working with. So we were working through that together. He hopped on a call with Keenan. Um, you know, we had a conference call, the three of us. So I was listening in, you know, they were talking about their strength stuff, but obviously, you know, putting my two cents in and things like that. So constant communication. What sure. am I doing in the pool? And, what is he doing on land and things like that? And I'm at every lift also. So I know it's not just like on paper. It looks hard. It's like, I know that they're crushed today. <laughs> For those young coaches who might not know, Keenan Robinson is the strength and conditioning coach at USA Swimming. Um, and if, if you've been fortunate to be out in Colorado Springs, he's exceptional and, and so knowledgeable. And that's awesome that you, that you were able to use that resource. And I think it's important for young coaches, Crystal, to know that, like, you can call USA Swimming. Somebody's going to get back to you. It's not this mythical place where you have to have a fast swimmer to get to know these people. Um, they're always, almost always available at some point to get back to you. Have you utilized the sports performance consultants throughout your development as a coach and, and of course, in the last few years at Penn Charter? I think I've just – I've never been afraid to just – go up to any coach, what's the worst? They give them the cold shoulder and walk away. I mean, I don't really care. So yeah, I mean, I talked to Greg Troy years ago and I talked to any big name coach that was on deck and didn't look busy and didn't have a swimmer in the water. I would just stroll up to them and ask questions. And a lot of coaches are also just really friendly. And, you know, I might be standing next to them after Reese has a swim and then we end up chatting about something. So Asking questions, I think, is huge. I don't think enough coaches do that. I don't know if it's pride. They think that they have the best ideas ever or they're afraid to ask. But I think asking questions and getting to know what other coaches are doing is great. And you don't have to do exactly what they're doing. But, you know, I might see a set online 
and I take one line out of it, but it inspired me to write the rest of practice just because my brain was kind of working, you know what I mean? So I'm not even using that practice probably at all, but something in there made me create the practice for that day just because, you know, it gets your brain working. So is Reese sending you Coach Durden sets? He actually doesn't that much. There were a couple sets. <laughs> I sent him a set and he was like, I'm going to give this to Chase, who's the assistant coach. And he's like, I'm not going to tell the guys that I gave it to Chase, though. Because <laughs> there was an IM set that I think we were just chatting about. And he's like, you're ridiculous, but I'm going to make sure the IMers at Cal do this. Um, does, does Dave bounce some ideas off of you when, when planning things for Reese? Yeah, Dave's awesome. And sometimes I struggle with backstroke sometimes. So I've actually probably asked Dave more about backstroke. And, you know, we'll talk about Reese and his training and things like that. But I've asked him more questions about probably other strokes than just Reese. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. So this year, Crystal, when we're, we're thinking about games and fun things that we we do with our teams what was your favorite practice moment this year oh that's hard um i think it was maybe the third time we did a test set I'm trying to think what month it was it was before our december meet it was not i don't think it was originally in my brain as a test set but i loved it when it happened and then afterwards told them it was a test set <laughs> And I think we did it for the third time right before we were about to taper for our December meet. And I don't know what it was, but they just all fed off each other. I don't know if it was good music playing, whatever it was, but everyone was just amped up. And I get so excited. Like I can't even go to bed because I leave practice and like blast my music when there's a good practice. <laughs> so, and I tell them that I'm like, I get on a coach's high if you guys do an awesome job, I am pumped. I'm like, I don't want to leave here thinking, good practice. Because there's not a lot of times where I'm angry because it wasn't terrible. But, you know, you want to be something exciting and you want to stand out and, you know, go above and beyond those expectations, which is pretty cool. And they all just went at it and it was awesome. All right, so now I have to ask you what this set was. It was six 125s freestyle. And I think by the third time we did it, I think we did them all, all out. So sometimes I'll have it, you know, one to three descend, four to five all out. But it was like, you know, race day is coming up. You need to be fast on number one. Number one is prelims. In order to get to finals, you need to be fast in prelims. So we're going all out on one. And then just kind of seeing what happens. Like you might die. Like you may not make the interval on number five, but we're going in. And a lot of my team struggles with that because if they've been with me since they were younger, we're so big on technique and race plans and things like that. But then they get almost too good at it where I'm like, okay, the splits are perfect now. Now we need to change something. Like you, you have to go. Don't be afraid. Um so, and they finally went after it and a few of them died and a few of them just, you know, crushed it all the way through six and, you know, maybe went a little bit faster, but you could tell it wasn't like a save up Sally situation. Yeah. I mean, how are we going to learn to come back fast if we don't go out fast? Yeah. You know, we're not going to find limitations in those comfort zones. Um, you mentioned your rock and music at practice. Dan Flack said it's, it's part of the reason why kids go fast at Baylor. Is it part of the reason why kids go fast at Penn I think Charter? So. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes so it, if they don't look great, I'll just turn the music off. I'm like, you need to earn the music. It's not here to soothe you. <laughs> We're going. Yes. I love it. Um, this is one of our favorite questions on the coach's corner. You're stuck on a desert island. You have junior national level athletes. You can only do three sets. What are they? Oh. What are the most important sets at Penn Charter? What are we going to see? I like those 175 IMs. Tell me how that's set up. So, again, I'm not huge on repeating. So it might be one at the end of a set. It might be eight in a row on maybe a slower interval. But it's a 175 IM where they just cut off the last lap of free and they need to be their best 2 IM time or faster. 
It's awesome. And I love it. All right. If the effort is not there, sometimes I slice the interval. <clears throat> so if the effort is like, <laughs> eh, you get 10 seconds less rest every time until I see the effort. So, you know, seven and eight might be <laughs> really quick back to back, and that's not going to feel good. So you're switching from anaerobic to aerobic based on. Yeah, you can just mix it up, change it up right in the middle of the set. So I like those 175 IMs and that kind of hits everything. So I think I would need those. Um, do I have to pick a specific Ironman? No, you could just say Ironman. So, we know what yeah, that is. Definitely <laughs> the Ironman, which could be any variation. So I'm kind of cheating on that one. And then probably a kick set, a mix of kick on back, kick with board, 200s kick. You have to have some kick in there. Oh, yeah. definitely. For sure. When you were working with Reese and breaststroke, one of the big topics right now in coaching is the pullout. So what are some things that you did specifically with him to maximize that underwater pullout? Body line was huge. He, as he worked on body line strength, just everything. And again, I started coaching him when he was 11. So staying on top of those growth spurts and technique and things like that. Also not being afraid to mess with the technique. I think some coaches are like, well, they're fast. So we'll just keep it. I don't believe in that. <laughs> um, so with him, I would say probably the biggest thing was body line. So obviously he has a great jump off the wall, being tight in and out of the wall obviously hugely important, but for him, he would into the fly kick a lot of times arch. So he would seek the surface with his upper body, didn't necessarily know it. So when he went his minute point one in the hundred breaths long course three years ago, off his dive, he had a huge bend and he watches it and he's like, there's my 59. And it's so true. So again, working on that and trying to work with that in practice, he can do it with a great body line. But when you get amped up and you're trying to go fast, you know, things change a little bit and we could use that underwater video and he could see that and he still hasn't gone 59. So that was his opportunity. He has gone a 59 <laughs> relay split, but I would say that body line is huge. Just, hitting each of those motions with that super tight core. You're going to see the best swimmers like hit that fly kick. And then for that split second, it's just perfect body line, pull perfect body line. And then that kick out. When you watch Adam Petey, you see that, right? When you see Adam Petey finish the down kick in his fly breaststroke, it's, so pull tight. Out, it's almost like your body surges forward. Yep. So yeah, that, that's, that's something great. And, and that, that's really it's really interesting that you guys were able to see that bend and, and identify that. And he's such a brilliant person to begin with. I'm sure he's thinking of that all yeah. the time. This is another favorite question. I stumped Ron Aiken last weekend with this. He refused to answer it. Uh oh. <laughs> but I'm I know because I know the way that you train, I think I'm gonna get a good answer from you. Will the eight minute barrier in the eight hundred free go down in Tokyo? Yeah. For women. Sure. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Without a doubt. I, 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 yeah. Now let me ask you this. What's it going to take 100 meter breaststroke to make the Olympic team? Men's or women's? Men's. This, this number has got to be going through your head. 58-2. I think you're right on. I think you're right on. I think we're going to see some American think records it's going to be fast. in that. It's going to be so yeah. fast. I have kept you now for 75 minutes. You did a wonderful job. Thank you so much for jumping on the coach's corner. I do want to remind the coaches who are on here, if you jump on the webinar with John Urbanchek on Thursday, we are giving away uh, an Arena Carbon Pro. So we, that's that could be a gift that you get to your athletes. Nice. So, Crystal, thank you so Absolutely. much. How can people get in contact with you if they have questions? Uh, my email is fine. So it is ckeelan at pencharter.com. Awesome. 
Crystal, thanks Absolutely. so much. Thanks, everybody, for being on the Coach's thanks Corner. Thanks for having me. Look forward to seeing you soon, anytime. And uh, good luck to you and Penn Charter for the rest of this summer. You too. Thank you. Thank you.